I'm sure Mr. John's going to tell us about our stage here. Sure. <laughs> All right, so we had a great week at VBS. We had 31 signed up. Highest attendance was uh, 28, but we saw all the kids throughout the week, different times, different places and stuff, in and out. A lot of summer vacations got started, so even today uh, we have some people out and stuff. So just remember, when it comes time for your vacation, which everybody's well-deserved and stuff, make sure you check in with us online, the YouTube, the Facebook, either watching it live and making a comment or, again, watching it later as the recorded episode and stuff. Again, never going to be as good as being here, but, but make sure you check in when you, you are away this summer. And so, again, an excellent VBS, but now we can take the calendar there and sort of fold it down so that VBS is off the picture. And we can see that, that there's so much else on the calendar we want to be ready for. So don't forget, it's going to be Lift Ladies this week as Second Monday. Uh, the young people are starting a movie night at uh, 7 p.m. in the evenings. They're figuring out exactly what they're allowed to stream and stuff, so you come for that. Uh, the, it will be Silver Saints this, uh, this Thursday. Again, my understanding is it's an old-fashioned sing. Edward, need I say more? So you come and enjoy that. And uh, we've got, a, a, I understand, a group from another church coming to join us that day. So again, and then Watermelon Festival. Whatever's involved with that as far as youth participating, adults helping with that. But the Watermelon Festival will be this weekend for the things. And then don't forget, just as if you need the reminder, Father's Day next Sunday, Father Day's next Sunday. And then last of all, we wanna talk about, we have a special service opportunity. Again, Samaritan's Purse has arrived. Meaning, what does that mean? Samaritan Purse, of course, is the organization that does the, the Christmas Operation Shoebox, that what we do at Christmas time, but they also have services for the disaster areas. So they have arrived in town, they are uh, allowing volunteers to come out, with the proper paperwork and releases, of course, and, uh, and help them with the cleanup. Again, if you haven't ever been down Appalachie Parkway, it looks great now. But all you have to do is pick any neighborhood, especially to the south of Appalachie Parkway, and you won't go very far until you see the tree down on the house, the tarp, the, the type of things. For, for a very localized area, it's just as bad as a hurricane. Of course, most of them do have power back now, but, but the one house they, that they had me visit just to, to check on damages and stuff, no trees on the house, but when you see every appliance they had stacked on the curb for trash pickup, well, you know something had to happen electrically in that house that, that all the appliances were just blown. So, so again, you can imagine what that's like now get all that replaced, get all that, deal with insurance, deal with these type of things. So it's Samaritan's Purse because, again, it surprises me to see a tree still on a house right now. Now, again, why isn't it taken care of? Why, you know, and again, insurance, whatever. But again, that's what Samaritan's Purse is here to do, to help with those types of needs. So there is sign-up information in the back. Uh, Christy will be out there. Christy Manuel will be heading that up. And, uh, and again, taking and explaining, again, what they need, the services they need, and the types of ways you can help. So if you're interested in that, and then my understanding is it will be for... Uh, two Tuesdays and then a Saturday this month. So you check that out and see if you're available for any of that. All right, with that, we want to go to our um, looking at our scripture for this morning and then our prayer time. So the scripture is Psalm 62 2 from the New Living Translation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will never be shaken. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the gospel message. Lord, you allowed me to once again share it in Sunday schools, looking at uh, Galatians chapter 3, and it was gospel from start to finish. Abraham believed in the Old Testament. He believed you were who you said you were, and you would do what you said you would do. And he was saved because of that belief. And we also believe you are who you said you are, Jesus the Son of the living God, the promised Messiah, and that you did what you said you were going to do. You died on the cross for our sins, you were buried, and you were raised from the dead. Lord, it is you that saves us through our belief in your message. We thank you, we praise you, in Jesus' name, amen.
let's all continue, um, stand as we continue to sing. And we're going to sing the spirit song. Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill your lambs. on the promises.
And at this time, we're going to have a video of our week's events while at Bible school. It's written in the code of who we are To know and love each other With a love that only comes from God's own heart There's so much for you and me When it's Jesus who we see Good morning, everybody. I told some folks that I went scuba this week. If, in case you don't know what I mean, that was our theme this weekend. I asked Jason uh, to take pictures, but to not take me in them as proof that I'm here all the time on Sunday mornings with my face in there. He still managed to catch me by the food in the fellowship hall. I'm okay with that because we had a great week. There were so many wonderful things, and not only the kids, but the adults. All of you that participated and and such, what a blessing it was to see. Um, We are in the midst of the finalizing moments of this, but I wanted you to see what all was around us this week. If you could take time to ask some of the children some of the things... There's so many wonderful stories to share, and I can't wait to do some of those on Wednesday nights and things. But God bless us. We're going to enter into something interesting over the next couple of weeks. 
we're never going to be done talking about the cross and the resurrection. But over the last several months, we've been talking about those things through the cross and resurrection. At the end of June, I just want to plant a seed. At the end of June, we're going to enter into the wisdom letters of Solomon. And so we're going to do Song of Solomon, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes in that order. Um, if you are a single individual, we're going to teach you how to court, how to date, how to find the right one for you. If you are married, we're going to tell you how to fight and how to keep it civil. We're going to teach you about loving. We're going to teach you about all kinds of things. Uh, parenting. We're going to talk about grandparenting. We're going to talk about how to finish well, now you might ask, well, how long is that going to take you? Listen, I probably won't cover every single verse. Some of that's going to be homework for you, but we're going to have a great time getting into it. But today, I want to tell you something neat. We're going to complete this section in uh, Romans chapter 8. Because what happens is, a lot of times when we go through God's Word, I'm excited about anything I'm going to teach or anything that I'm going to explain. But today more so, because here's why. I want to highlight some things for you. If you're a note taker, get ready. If you're traveling abroad and you got it turned up in your car, turn it up even louder. Maybe the car next to you will hear it. Here's what's going to happen. Because as we get into Scripture today, I want you to understand some things that are extremely important because far too many Christians are carrying around yesterday's problems into tomorrow. And far too many Christians are allowing things to influence them when it was supposed to be Christ that influences in every single way. So here's what's going to go through. There are many today that are struggling. And what I hope is by the time we're done, when we complete this uh, sermon of God is for us, is for you, instead of always being haunted by your past, that you'll finally realize that God is indeed with you every single moment. Okay? So here's what's going to happen. Some of you came today and you've got a current crisis or you've got some family members or friends that have it. Maybe you even have a crisis within your faith. I want you to know that when you trusted in Jesus, that the riches of His glory, the riches of His life, and we're not talking about just monetary wealth, but they were available to us. That doesn't mean that it's a get-rich-quick scheme. That's not what we're referring to. Although many of you may have the testimony that you can't outgive God. What we discovered is that we were actually born rich in the faith. When we trusted in Jesus, His blessings of peace, they can't be placed with value because for anybody who's ever gone without peace understands the terrific loss that that is. We have no limit to the knowledge of things that we can learn about God. But for us, it's not just enough to have a sense of peace, not just enough to have a little bit of knowledge. We actually have to grow in our understanding of Him if we're ever going to truly appreciate the glory that God has. Too many Christians have actually not read the Bible. Too many Christians have not read the Bible enough. A lot of times when we get into these Bible studies, we'll say, what's going on with your life? And somebody will go, I have a confession. My confession is I don't read my Bible enough. I don't know if you have the gift of sarcasm, but for many of you, you would go, well, yeah, sure. All of us can relate to that. But many of you have been through some terrible situations. And you think that your faith might actually be too weak to experience the amazing God we serve. Some of you think that if God really knew what I've done, or if people understood what was in my past or even in my mind, they'd go running and screaming from me. Perhaps maybe every single time you try to do something. It just seems like the evil things of life try to stop you. Or you've been afraid to take certain steps of faith because when you did, you failed. But let me ask you, what good would it be to have wealth in the Lord, faith in the Lord, if you're too weak to use it? Or what if you're so afraid of robbers or evil that you can't really enjoy it? See, I don't know if you know all the history. I certainly don't know all of it. But it's interesting to me that for those of you who know the name of Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller, he was the world's first billionaire. It's said that for many years that he lived on crackers and milk. 
because he had stomach problems. But if you'd like to know the root cause of his stomach problems, he was constantly full of worry. And he had guards standing at the door 24 hours a day because he was afraid that someone would rob him. Somebody would hurt him. He lived his life in constant fear and worry. But here's what happened. He began to share what God had given. And when he did, he shared knowledge. He shared money. He began to give to all kinds of different charities. And do you know what occurred? His health improved. And he lived a long life. And so ladies and gentlemen, what you learned just this last week in VBS... What was the last thing that you learned about God? And if your answer is, well, a year ago, then we need to talk about what you're learning currently. I need to impress upon you this idea of learning. Because as true as it is in physical wealth, there's spiritual wealth. And the lesson I want you to learn today, it costs a life. But its value is priceless. So would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we love you with all our heart. And there are many today that are struggling uh, emotionally, physically. I ask that you bless those who are in travel today, that they're not just safe, but that they enjoy the day you gave them. And so, Lord, as we look at your word, I ask that you change us from the inside out. With great thanksgiving, we live for you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, how's our energy level? Are y'all ready? I got to make up, even though I taught uh, each of uh, the, the adults that came, I have a lot of information stored up, so I hope you're in for a long thing. Buckle your seatbelts, because today's going to be a lot of fun for me. Can y'all agree with that? For me, right? Okay, so here goes. We're going to talk about confidence, and as we're continuing to talk about confidence, that God is indeed for us, here's the situation to catch up in case you missed it. Ready? Confidence is a popular subject. I certainly get it. Some people actually have it, and some people actually fake it, and others don't have it at all. But the Bible says there's some things that we should not have confidence in. For instance, in Philippians 3, 3 it says, "...who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus." but don't have confidence in the flesh. Paul wrote these words, simply put, to counter all the claims that those who thought, I'm acceptable to God because of who my family is, what I do, or how religious or how devoted I am. Some of us have that same mindset. We feel real good with God when we have dotted all the I's, crossed the T's, checked the box religiously. It's like the more religious you are, the more confidence you have in what you've done instead of what Jesus has done. And that is never supposed to be the avenue that we take. And so in Acts 10, Peter said in 34, opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. I struggle with that. Because for years I used to compare myself to all my crazy family. All my crazy friends. And compared to them, I'm gold. Compared to those people you might work with, aren't you awesome? And compared to those people that don't put their buggy back in the grocery store. Now, if you're feeling convicted right now, we need to have a talk about that. But here's the deal. You compare yourself against somebody that fails in an area that you don't, but God isn't partial like that. That stuff doesn't matter to him in those contexts. He's not looking at your DNA. He's not looking at your resume. He's not looking at that as to be partial to you. That's not how he works. If we're going to be confident in something, anything, Psalm 118, 8 and 9 told us what it is to be. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Just why is it better to put confidence in Jesus than those who are running for president now or in the future? Or those who have social agendas or financial incentives? Because the world as we know it, it wants to benefit from you. The world doesn't want to be changed by you. It wants to change you for their benefit. And many can testify that the world will use you, hurt you, leave you when you no longer add to what they want in life. 
when you don't fit into their desires, simply put, they'll condemn you for your past. They'll condemn you for not being what they want you to be. And if you aren't condemned at something, then you need to exit your door more frequently than you are. Because anywhere you go, it's a possibility. In truth, what it means is that those who created the problems of this world, they really aren't a part of the solution, that only God is the solution for mankind. See, the disciples showed us that they can learn, that they can write, that they can serve. But what's so interesting is that they relied fully on the Holy Spirit with the wisdom and knowledge that He gave. It wasn't their agenda. So what happens when people don't agree with your faith? What happens when you tell everybody, well, Jesus is the answer? What happens when your bosses or coaches, this is what we talked about, withhold opportunities from you, might accuse you of not being a team player in the job site because of your faith? Well, Paul answered in Romans 8.31, what shall we say to these things if God's for us who can be against us? It's simply put, we're secure in the love of Christ because God is for us. We don't need to fear the past, the present, the future, because we're secure in the love of Christ. Now, it doesn't matter what time, whether you're young or you're old. It doesn't matter what the agendas are. Those always change anyways. It doesn't matter about the politics because political people come and go all the time. The truth is, If you're trying to make folks like you, the truth is, if you're trying to please everybody, it will never, ever happen. In truth, you shouldn't let things like that hinder your walk in Jesus. Why? Because God is for you. Who can be against you? I know that's hard for some of you to believe as we get into Scripture of 32 and on today. Some of you, as I said last week, you're like Jacob, the son of Isaac. You think that the whole world is against you. You think that all the situations that have fallen on you has been either your fault or somebody else's and you just have this blame game and there's shame that goes around and condemnation that we'll talk about today. But Jacob, when he was saying these things, like all these things are against me, it was because his other sons had come and demanded that Benjamin go with them to Egypt. How was Jacob supposed to know that with his heart being broken over his son Joseph, that what Joseph said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, Jacob is just focused on the current situation that's bothering him. He didn't know that if he went to Egypt that he was going to get his son back that he thought he lost. He didn't know that the food that they so desperately needed was already provided. He didn't know that there was shelter there. He didn't know these things any more than you and I do. You don't know what tomorrow will hold. And so because of that, I know it's hard for us to believe in the plan of God, but He has a great one in store for each and every one of us. So maybe what you need today is a reminder of how much God loves us. And in Romans 8, 32 and on, it says, He did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us. How shall I not be with Him who also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. The second point last week was so easy to please, but it said this, When God declares you righteous in Christ, that declaration never changes. It never, ever changes. That's the power of what Jesus did. This is the amazing thing that God does for each of us. God gave us His very best when we were at our very worst. Do you think that He wouldn't take care of you now? When you were at your very worst, He gave you His absolute best. Is there something in your mind today that says, well, does God even notice where I'm at? Does He even understand what I'm going through? We're saved in Christ. We're accepted in Christ. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment because here's what happens. What good would the sacrifice of Jesus be if the salvation He was giving each of us was yanked away just because of your circumstances. Some of you might say, well then how come my family and friends make me feel so bad over the things that I've done or so bad about my relationship with Jesus? 
I mean, I try to do right, but sometimes my desires get the best of me. And then I really mess things up. I mean, I'm guilty, I get it. Maybe that's what you're saying. But it seems like others in your life just constantly remind you of your guilt. They love to point out where you failed. They love to point out where you have had flaws, where you've had sin. But listen, I've got great news for you today because here's what the Bible says in verse 34. It says, Who is He who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. See, what Paul writes, it's simple. Our greatest problem isn't finances. It isn't racism. It isn't politics. It isn't, it isn't even the opinions of others. Our greatest problem is sin. And because of that, the solution was given by God through His Son, Jesus. It came from the cross. It came from the resurrection. So when you came to know Jesus, you might have been under the impression that now that I know Jesus, I'll never sin again. And when you did, that reaction from your family or your friends, you know the one that goes, I can't believe He said that. I can't believe they did that. I can't believe they went to that place. It's amazing the reaction that family and friends can give you over the things that you have said, done, and been to. And when you got that reaction from them, that condemnation from them, and in case you don't know what condemnation, it's the expression of very strong disapproval. It's the look that kills you. Some of y'all grew up with that family member, didn't you? You had a mama, grandmama, dad, grandpa, somebody in the family. When they looked at you, that was worse than a beating. And so because of that, you understand what that expression is. Maybe when you did something, you even felt like a hypocrite. But the good news is that Jesus continues to bring each of us His strong salvation and mighty hand. Folks, we weren't given salvation on a temporary basis. It's not a use it or lose it category. If you do something wrong that somehow your salvation is taken from you, you need to understand the meaning of justification. Because understanding that should bring you peace to our hearts. When God declares... A believing individual, this sinner, righteous in Christ, that declaration never changes. When he saved you at 5, 15, 25, 55, 95, none of that changes based on what you thought, what you did, or where you went. You were a sinner when he found you. Did you think you was going to stop sinning just because you said, Dear Jesus, please save me? That's not the way that works. But like Spurgeon said, it's not that we're sinless, but that the desire of our heart ought to be that we sin less. And so because of that, our Christian experience It changes from the situations day to day. But the salvation, the justification, that never changes. Listen, in case you're new, my name's Jared. And I'm not the same guy I was six months ago. But I don't think I'm the same guy I was 25 years ago. Can't you say the same? And so our situations, our circumstances will change. But when I got saved at almost 17, that salvation has not changed now that I'm 45. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so understanding this wonderful third point, it's not my last one, by the way. Uh, uh, I know I normally do three, but stay with me. Here it goes. Both the Spirit, write this down, both the Spirit and the Son intercede for us. Boy, this is going to be good. I'm getting pretty excited about it. So if I get a little loud, just humor me. I promise not to cry. Here we go. When you sin, or you backslide in your faith, I imagine that most everybody has had that experience. I don't know, but I imagine that's been the case. You aren't stuck without hope. You know why? Because both the Holy Spirit and Jesus Himself, the same one, intercede for us. The same Savior who died is interceding us for us in heaven. So for those people in your life, your family, your friends, those who work with you, school with you, whatever it is, do those same people talk about you and condemn you? Do you think they intercede for you? 
Ask them the next time that they're critical over you. Ask them next time that they condemn you and they give you a strong disapproval for the things you've said, done in places that you have gone. If they ever spend any time at all praying for you. If they intercede for you. See, part of the reason that Jesus doesn't condemn us is He's too busy interceding and praying for us. Jesus doesn't have time to condemn you because He's too busy saving. He doesn't have time to condemn you because He's too busy saying, look, Jared's a moron. But I made him that way and he's growing. All right, I don't know if that's what Jesus says about me, but that is the way I feel about me sometimes. Can you all appreciate that? Now, don't say amen because you'd be saying, I mean, I'm a moron, right? But see, those same people who are condemning you The truth is, they probably don't pray for you at all, or they spend very little time praying for you. Or if they're praying for you, it's probably in the version of this. Dear God, fix that knucklehead. Fix that individual. Well, that's pretty lacking in the prayer category. Wouldn't you think that? You don't even know what's wrong with them. Except sin. And so what it means is, don't get me wrong, you need to understand this. You're going to reap what you sow. But a life that has experienced the grace of Jesus Christ offers grace to others. And so a saved life, it's going to offer forgiveness. It's going to offer help. They serve God because they love Him. And they love what Jesus did for them. They don't serve God because if they don't, Jesus is going to start accusing them, condemning them, and sending them to hell and throwing them away. That's not how this works. Jesus is too busy interceding on our behalf and creating a place for us in the future to bring condemnation. Which tells me this, for those of you who have family and friends, people you work with, people you're in school with, on teams with, if they're busy condemning you, it means that they're probably not doing God's will in their life. They're not serving. They're too busy pointing out what they think you're doing is wrong. Now, can I get a small amen to that or did I just step on some toes? Let's try that again. Was I right? That was weak. As our high priest, Jesus can give us the grace we need to overcome temptation and defeat the enemy. As our advocate, the one who intercedes for us, he can forgive our sins and restore us in our fellowship with God. There's no condemnation from Jesus because we share the righteousness of God. This law cannot condemn us. You would never be able to sacrifice enough to to somehow win over God. All of us cannot say all the right things. You can't think the right thoughts. You don't even go to the right places all the time. Jesus didn't save us because we added to His glory. He knew that we couldn't be saved without Him. So intercession means that Jesus Christ on the throne, He represents us before God that we don't have to represent ourselves. I don't know if you've given any thought to this, but if you had to stand before a holy God and explain your sin, is there any reason that He would accept it? We try to be gracious people, and if somebody gives me a reason for all the bad they do, I might try to be kind-hearted and go, oh, well, that's okay, I'm, I'm a moron too. But that's not what God would say. Remember, when you stand before a holy God, you're not even going to say anything. And so because of that, in studying about the cross and the resurrection, we're not only saved by His death, we're saved because He came back to life. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore, He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. That means the worst of the worst of the worst can be saved. The question is, do you want them to be saved? The question is, do you want to be saved? Do you feel like you've done something so bad that God would yank your salvation away? It's not true. 
Do you feel that somehow or another that each Saturday heading into a Sunday that you need to apologize not for just everything you did because you knew it was wrong, but you need to apologize so that you'll know that God still loves you no matter what? Well, the answer is simple. He loves you no matter what because he is able to save to the very worst because he's constantly interceding on our behalf. Let's say it a different way. You ready? Jesus right now is talking about you to the Father. Right now. And you think, how's that possible? How's that possible? Because he's God. You ever seen some folks that have uh, attention issues and they're able to hold on about five conversations at one time? Because he's God, he can have a limitless conversation about you and me. What's he saying about you today? What kind of faith, what kind of love are we expressing today? What kind of need do we have of Jesus Christ today? Jesus is interceding for each of us. What it points out is it's a promise. It's a promise that we're totally secure. Had a chair once that I loved. Had to get rid of it because I think my, it, I just wore it out. I just wore out the chair. This chair was so comfortable that I would plop in it. Do y'all, do y'all know what I mean by plop? I just knew it was going to hold me up. I just knew it every single time. didn't matter to me. I just would fall into it. And it was this moment. Each time that I sat in it, it was just like this. Oh, I just knew it. I just knew it. I'd had this chair for so many years. And some of you... In our order to understand this reference, it's quite simple. When we go to Jesus, we have the same faith that is bigger than what I had in that chair. Is that no matter what we do when we come to Jesus, it's not like Jesus is going to pull the chair away from us and we fall on the floor and he's going to laugh. That's not how God works. In fact, he's going to embrace you. He's going to take care of it because he's interceding. Now, I said that I had wore out my chair because I used it. I think some of you, over time, you may feel like God has worked that way. You feel like you have worn God out so much that He might stop interceding for you, so you're afraid to do anything. That's not how that works. I don't know if you're aware, but God never gets tired of interceding for you. Do you know why? Because He saved you. He gave His life for you and me. And then God would be awfully foolish if he paid a debt and he didn't get a life in return. So he didn't save you just to throw you away. He saved you to build a life in you. And so here's what's happening. You ready? We're going to have some fun. Let me encourage you today. I wish we could get this under our mindset. That it's God alone. In our world, it's popular that we would remind people that only God can judge. Today, church, I want to emphasize something important that only God can judge is actually factually incorrect. First of all, we have judges. Don't know if you're aware of that. Do something wrong and you'll find out real quick. Agreed? Oh, come on, folks. I even had ha-ha in my notes right here. So the truth is, we actually have judges, and anybody in this room can judge all they want to. It's their choice. Thank God we live in America. So here, let me encourage you today. Stop giving your testimony, listen to me, stop giving your testimony by telling everybody what you did before salvation like it's a badge of honor. Don't spend 45 minutes telling everybody how unbelievably corrupt you were and then a minute of your salvation and a minute after Jesus we have all eternity to live for Jesus I don't think we ought to spend 45 minutes talking about how bad you are because that's not who you are anymore right also let's stop giving the testimony where we go well that was pre-Jesus you don't understand before I met Jesus this is how I was After I met Jesus, I would not. Listen, we all agree with that. So let's make it real simple. You ready? What is it that you've been doing since you met Jesus? Because here's the important part of it. That's the only part that counts. 
I don't know if I said that loud enough, so I'm not going to scream it. So let's do it again. Ready? The only part that matters is what happened after you met Jesus. Here's the only part that also matters. You ready? The forgiveness, the interceding that He does for you every single time. Your sin is forgiven. Now, do you realize that? Or have you been carrying all of yesterday into the future? So what the Bible teaches is that Jesus is the only one who is a perfect judge. And Jesus... His Spirit intercedes on our behalf. So instead of saying, well, only God can judge me when I mess up, or instead of getting hugely defensive when someone starts pointing out your sins, and then you start pointing out their sins as a way of competition, you need to go home today and remind yourself that only Christ can intercede on your behalf and you need help. So if somebody comes out to you and they start pointing out to you everything you do wrong, instead of taking it personal, just cling to Jesus. I did it wrong, Lord, again. I've got this addiction. I'd love to get rid of it again. I've got this mind thing. I've got this heart thing. I've got this issue in my life. I've got this sin in my life, God. And people keep pointing it out. But I need your help. Jesus can solve the issue and forgive the sin. I've never had somebody in my office, not once in all my life, not once has ever come to my office and go, I am so glad that my wife, my husband, my children, my grandchildren, my bosses, my teachers, my whatever, they have nagged me to death and I have changed. I would like to thank me. Never once, never once have I had that. But do you know what I have had in my office? God never left me, and He finally delivered me of this. God has been looking out for me, and I wish I could have done it earlier, but His timing is perfect. Look at me now. Look at what God did. And so because of that, there are too many Christians who are trying to live a perfect Christian life in their own power, for the approval of people around them instead of living a life that Jesus wants for His approval, His glory. Jesus is our high priest and through His intercession we can approach Him at any time in the grip of grace. It's right there for each of us to experience. Do you think that other people in your life would be quick to give you mercy if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit in their life to begin with? See, church, no matter what you've done, before salvation or afterwards, you can talk to God about anything. Jesus doesn't condemn you, even if you're too busy condemning yourself. I've heard it said countless times. It's, it's, it's not correct, but I'll go ahead and address it. There's so many speakers on stage, so many books, so many people that write, and they say, well, you just need to forgive yourself. Well, first of all, if I could forgive myself, I wouldn't need the forgiveness of Jesus. But let's take it a different approach. Here's what they really mean, so stay with me. You need to stop condemning yourself because even Jesus is not condemning you. Let me say that again. Some of you are so busy condemning yourself the thing you did last week, last month, last year, last years. Places you went, things you did, stuff you went through. And it cycles on your mind and your heart and you carry it with you like two huge uh, chips on your shoulders. And when people look at you, it's almost as if you're always hanging your head because you remember what you said and did. But stay with me. Some of you are carrying the shame, this condemnation. Not about what you did. Some of you are carrying shame and condemnation for stuff you didn't do and you should have. You see, some of you didn't finish the project. You didn't finish the degree, the addiction that you should have left behind. You still haven't. The holes of your life have been filled with what you didn't do versus other people are filled with what they did do. Either way, what we learned this week in VBS for the adults is Joel 2 
In 26 and 27, God told us twice while He was speaking as the God of Israel. And He says, I am the Lord your God. There is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. You don't have to carry the shame of yesterday in with you today and tomorrow and on because shame comes from the devil, not the Lord. It's time to let it go. It's time to live our lives for Jesus because our lives are supposed to be filled with Him and not our past. And Ephesians 3.17 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes all knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. I think people are carrying so much shame with them Because they either didn't learn about the intercession of Jesus in His Spirit, or they have forgotten that God doesn't shame His people, and He doesn't condemn them either. And so moving on to my last point, and it's a quick one, so stay with me, but it's a very important one. Are you carrying the shame Are you carrying shame with you? In a few moments, I want to invite you to get rid of it. You know what? Let's just give it to the fish and let them have it. Wouldn't you agree? Are you carrying the shame of your family? Your parents? Grandparents? Your children? Grandchildren? Are you carrying things for them? And you realize the burden has been so hard on you that today you finally realize through God alone it's time to let it go. See, today, no matter what you think about God, don't ever forget how much He loves you. He's filling every hole if you invite Him with His presence, His mercy, His grace, His knowledge. Now, none of these wonderful promises are meant as an excuse for us to sin. Having freedom doesn't mean you go do whatever you want. We have the freedom to love God and there's nothing that's going to stop us. So what happens if you do sin? Maybe that's what you're asking. I get it. God's not going to condemn me, but... Let's be honest, half the prayers we could pray is, Father, forgive me, I know exactly what I'm going to do. Well, Paul proved to us that God's love, He cannot fail us. And so you're asking perhaps, well, is it possible for me to fail Him? I mean, suppose some great trial or temptation or something comes and I just fail, I just sin, I just do it, then what? Does God stop loving me? Does God stop interceding for us? This is the one of the most truly magnificent parts of our scripture. You ready? In Romans 8, 35 and on, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine? Or how about nakedness, peril, sword? As it is written, for your sake we're killed all day long. We're accounted for sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we're more conquerors. More than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The last wonderful promise that we have today is something that you can absolutely write down. Put it into your heart. It's simple. If and when you fail, because you will. But you don't have to. If and when you fail, nothing, nothing. I just wish I had capitalized it. I wish I'd put it in all big bold and block letters and underlined it. Whatever you got. Nothing. You know what I like about the nothing word? Is that there is no possibility from coming back from that. You know, when you see a score, 
I must confess, I'm not chasing a rabbit. Please stay with me. It, it always bothers me a little bit. I, I like soccer. We call it soccer. I know there's football around the world. That's fine. But when it's a 0-0 zero, zero score, that bothers me. Because they still keep track of all that. I don't get it. But at the end of other things, there's usually a score. There's a winner and a loser. And if they score a zero, that's nothing. They usually win. But in this context, there's no evil situation that wins. Because nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. You see... In verse 36, it says that we're killed all day long and counted sheep for the slaughter. You may not know what that means. And that's okay because I'm going to tell you. See, this verse might seem kind of harsh because for some they think, well, if Jesus loves us, then why did I go through that terrible thing? Why didn't this person win this? Why didn't this person achieve this? Why didn't we get the job, the house, the situation? Why didn't I marry this individual? Why, 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 why? Why did all these bad illnesses hit me? You could do that till you absolutely stopped running out of questions and you probably wouldn't. Why did this stuff happen to me? To begin with, God does not shelter us from the difficulties of life. Why? Because we need them for spiritual growth. Every single time the worst thing that happens to you, you probably go into prayer right then and there. Whenever something terrible falls your way, you get more devoted than you ever were prior. How do you know that that terrible thing didn't come into you because you've been slowly but surely trying to remove yourself from the spiritual devotion that you know you should have? And so there's no promise that everything's going to be easy. Being a Christian is not easy. And if they told you it was, they lied to you. But having that difficulty in life, it's like the promise of Romans 8.28. God assures us that the difficulties of life are working for us and not against us. That God permits all these trials to come our way so that it would be for our good and His glory. We endure trials for His sake. And since we endure them at His request, do you think that He would leave us? We're studying the book of Job in Sunday school. Many of you have enjoyed that book. But what you need to know is that God allowed those things to hit Job real early on in His his life. He permitted it to happen. Now, because He permitted that to happen, was there anybody that read the book of Job that thought God was going to leave Job? Are you any different? Of all the bad things that has happened to you, if God allowed that to happen, do you really think that God would leave you now? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite poems is still the footprints poem. I'm walking along, I see two footprints, right everybody? And when the times are at the worst, I see one set of footprints. And I'm thinking, God, where'd you go? What the footprints poem say? It wasn't that he went anywhere, it was then that he carried us. Now tell me that isn't straight out of the Bible in that context, right? See, don't you get it? Is that when these things hit you, it's not that He would ever leave you. Why? Because nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing. Divorce doesn't separate you. Bankruptcy doesn't separate you. You see, losing jobs, losing family members, diseases... Nothing separates you from the love of Christ Jesus because when you are at your worst in sin, He gave His life for you and for me. So let me finish. When He's closer to us, when He's carrying us, He gives us the power to conquer. In fact, the Bible says that we're more than conquerors. I don't know what that means. I actually tried to look that up. I know when I come up here on Sundays and Wednesdays, I, I'd like to know what everything means. I don't know what it's like to be a more than conqueror. I only know what it's like to win. I like to win. 
I like to watch those kids when they were playing the VBS games, and I loved, if you'll forgive me, I loved seeing the team that won. Each one of them high-fived, raised their hands, jumped up for joy. The little ones would dance. That was always my personal favorite. They'd do little circles, and they'd jump, and they'd do this, and then you'd have people, come on back, come on back. They had so much fun winning. The losers, for those that were pretty competitive, they hated losing. They hated it. It bothered them. Some of our kids, they'd even cry if they didn't get a chance to redeem themselves. I love that concept because what happens in our life is we are called in, to be more than conquerors because of what Jesus did. Which means that if we're crying, it ought to be because of godly repentance. We're sorry for what we've done. We want another chance to make it right. Not because we want to earn salvation back. We just want to again show God how much we love Him. He left the salvation with us. I just want another opportunity to prove to Him, I love you even though I'm a moron. Or even though I'm a sinner. To be more than a conqueror means that I will not fail in the end no matter what. So ladies and gentlemen, what would you do today if you knew that you would not fail. What would you do today if you knew you wouldn't fail? Would you call a loved one that you haven't talked to in forever, but the reason you haven't talked to them in forever is because y'all left on bad terms? What if you called them up and it went incredibly awesome? What if you actually did go for that job that you've been scared of? And what if it was incredibly a powerful moment? Instead, what if somebody who didn't know Jesus in your family, in your friends, in your work environment, and you walked up to them and go, look, here's the deal. Jesus loves you no matter what. But He loves you too much to leave you the way He found you. He's going to save you. You just have to want it. What would you do if you couldn't fail? To be more than a conqueror means that at the very end, I won't fail. Why? Because of what Jesus did, not us. There's a victory song that's being played now. I like the lyrics. It said, the weapon may be formed, but won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. See, this is a promise. That said, God, since you did this, I can live 100% for you. When I was little, I uh, bet y'all probably don't believe this, but I had a big mouth. Oh, that you laugh on? Appreciate that. And sometimes my mouth would get me in a little bit of trouble, especially with the older boys in my neighborhood. In case you don't know what a neighborhood, that's where there's more houses close to you than no way from you. I just want to make sure we all knew, understand that out here in Lloyd. And so here's the deal. In my neighborhood, my mouth would get me in trouble. But here's what's interesting. When I stood all on my own, I never really won. Now, I had two big brothers who used to never stick up for me until they knew I was outmatched. When they knew I was going to lose, they would always stand up. And I think some of us have thought that God only does that, that He only pays attention when we're outmatched. Well, I've got great news for you if that's how you feel. You're outmatched for everything. You're at a loss in every way. You need God in every single circumstance of life. And for those of you who actually understand that, it is incredibly awesome to think that we are free from judgment because Christ died and gave us His righteousness. Do you know that you're free from fear and you're free from defeat because Jesus Christ and His Spirit intercede with us and gave us life? Do you know that you no longer have to be discouraged this morning because Christ is coming again and we're going to share in that glory He's carrying you now. 
And so what are you truly afraid of? There's no condemnation. You don't even have to be obliged to do anything. You just need to love Him completely and serve Him and do His will just because you want to. Did you know that you don't have to be frustrated in Him? Did you know that there's no separation in Him? If God is for us, ladies and gentlemen, then who can be against us? So here it is. May God bless each of your hearts this day. We're going to sing a song. If you don't know who Jesus is, I want to invite you to come. I want to tell you about Jesus. And today is the day where you leave all that shame behind. Ask for His forgiveness. Now maybe you gave your heart to Jesus a long time ago. Let's make it even more simple for each and every one of us. For those of you who have been carrying the shame, the guilt, the sin of our yesterdays. Maybe this morning on your way to church you just had a big blowout. Isn't it interesting how that happens on Sundays? Well here it is as an altar. Then come forward and lay it out. Tell Him you're sorry. And don't carry it home with you. He's not going to condemn you. And you know what? Neither are we. May God bless each and every one of us. But please do what the Spirit wants now. Let's pray. Father, we love you with all our heart. And we thank you for everything you've done. This day is your day. May you move in our hearts this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and would you come? Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, Well, thank you all for coming today. May God bless you. Enjoy these moments. We've got lots of activities coming up. Please see Christy in the back. I believe this Tuesday is the first day that we're going to be helping Samaritan's Purse. So whether you want to work 30 minutes, hour, half a day, a full day, may God bless your efforts. Because I think many of you understand what it's like to have not just one tree, but all kinds of debris on your properties. So for anybody who can help, there's all kinds of moments. May God bless you, enjoy, take a nap, whatever you got, but do His will. Let's pray. Father, we love you, we thank you, and as we leave this place, let us walk in the freedom as more than conquerors in you. And I pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Goodbye, everybody.